This is a recording of chapter one, Introduction to Sustainability. So what is meant by the term environment? Environment is basically everything that is around us. It includes living and non-living things that we interact with. So some examples of non-living things would be air, water, energy, rocks and minerals. And some examples of living things would be plants, animals, and microbes, such as bacteria. Environmental science is an interdisciplinary study of how humans interact with their environment. Interdisciplinary means it goes across different disciplines, which would include natural sciences. So it includes chemistry, geology, and biology. The social sciences, where we may talk about economics and sociology. Humanities politics and policies also. A main aspect of environmental science is the study of ecology and ecosystems. Ecology is the study of how living things interact with each other and with their non-living environment. An ecosystem is a group of organisms in a defined area, which would be a habitat that interact with each other and with their living and non-living environment. Examples of such defined areas could be a forest, ocean, or a desert. And this down here is a little example of a forest. So you have a frog, a tree, and a rock. So habitats are places where organisms live. Again, forests, deserts, oceans are all examples of those. Examples of ecosystems, again, that's living and non-living components, right? Ecosystem, a group of organisms interacting with each other and with their living and non-living environment. So example of ecosystems, let's talk about a forest ecosystem. The living and non-living components, we have plants like trees, flowers, etc. The soil would be non-living, plants living. Minerals and nutrients in the soil, like phosphorus or nitrogen, which are nutrients for plants air, animals, water, mushrooms, sunlight, rocks. Those are all components of an ecosystem. And what does sustainability mean? That's the ability to keep on going or to be able to persist. How do we keep something going? In this course, we will explore the sustainability of specific ecosystems, as well as looking at the entire earth. And we're gonna focus on the ability for life to continue to persist into the future. An example of sustainability in your own life might be Let's say it's the start of the semester and maybe it's your first time at college, your first time living in a dorm room. Maybe you're not sleeping that much. Maybe you're not eating and drinking properly and you're partying a lot, going out late. That is not sustainable. It's not a sustainable way of life and Within a few weeks, you're probably going to be burnt out and really tired. You can't keep going with that lifestyle for that long a period of time. It's not a sustainable lifestyle. And some students end up failing out of all their classes. They end up having to drop out. They didn't get any work done. So it's not really sustainable.
there were three main themes of how life is able to continue existing on Earth despite catastrophic changes in the environment that have occurred over time. Some catastrophic changes that have occurred include the ice ages, perhaps a meteorite impact. Meteorite impacts can lead to mass extinctions. That is the theorized way that the dinosaurs were went extinct was from a meteorite impact. So there were three main themes, life's reliance on solar energy, biodiversity of life, and chemical cycling or nutrient cycling. So solar energy, biodiversity, and nutrient cycling. Life on Earth depends on solar energy. The sun provides energy for photosynthesis, and that means that some organisms can produce their own nutrients that they use for food. And this includes plants. Plants use photosynthesis. And the entire global food chain begins with organisms that make their own food through photosynthesis. So without solar energy, plants and animals would most likely cease to exist because the base of the food chain is reliant on the solar energy for photosynthesis. Biodiversity or biologic diversity means there is a vast variety of organisms, natural environments they live within, and natural services that they provide. Examples of some natural services provided by some organisms include photosynthesis, that would be by plants, for example, or oysters that help purify water. That's because they are filter feeders. So they take in water and they filter out nutrients and some contaminants, impurities in the water and then they release the filtered water. Earthworms help aerate and mix topsoil. Bacteria and fungus helps eliminate waste by the process of decomposition. And interactions between species helps with population control where you have predator and prey relationships. Variety of life is useful in the case of catastrophic events because there is a better chance of at least some organisms surviving. So out of all of the mass extinctions that we've had on Earth, and we have had five, you never had a situation where all the organisms on Earth have died and went extinct. You always had some organisms that existed and survived the mass extinctions. And that is mainly because of biologic diversity, where some organisms were just able to withstand the conditions related to the catastrophic events that led to the mass extinctions. And then nutrient cycling. Nutrient cycling is the concept that waste from one organism becomes nutrients for another organism. So there is very minimal amount of waste in nature. And here you have this elk that dies and then its body decomposes and the organic material goes back into the soil and it provides nutrients for, no for more plants to grow. And then the elk, or maybe that's a reindeer, I'm not really sure, will be eating the plants. So it's a circle of nutrients. And we could think about what would happen if the earth did not have any decomposition. Perhaps we would still have piles and piles and piles of dead plant and animal material of organisms that died hundreds of millions of years ago. 
that material would still be sitting on the Earth's surface and there would be no room for anything new to grow. And you would not have nutrients cycling where you have nutrients for new plants to grow. So decomposition is very important. How are humans disrupting nutrient cycles on Earth? You could think about that. For example, when you throw trash away and it ends up in a landfill, it is not going to decompose and go back into the soil in the ground. It is going to stay within the landfill. So that might be one way that we are disrupting nutrient cycles on Earth. And then we have some key components of sustainability. That includes natural capital, human activities, and solutions to problems. Natural capital includes natural resources and natural services. So natural resources include materials and energy in nature that are useful to humans. And we can categorize natural resources as being renewable and non-renewable. Renewable examples would be air, water, wind, and solar energy. And these are components that we do not run out of. Okay, there's always going to be air, water, wind, and solar energy available, generally speaking. Non-renewable resources can run out. That includes coal, oil, aluminum, other metals. And the natural services are natural processes that occur on Earth that support life and the economy. So for example, decomposition of waste by bacteria and fungi or using cow manure as fertilizer on farms. Cow manure is rich in nutrients, plant nutrients. And then this slide from the book shows you the natural resource examples in the blue boxes and the orange boxes are, shown, are showing the natural services. Human activities can degrade natural capital. Degrade means to lower the quality, diminish or deteriorate. And we could do this by using up non-renewable resources or using renewable resources faster than they can be replenished. For example, we could do this with groundwater. In some areas where you do not have a lot of precipitation, you can use up a lot of the groundwater because you are using it faster than it is replenished due to the climate in most cases. For example, Las Vegas is in a desert climate and you do have groundwater supplies, but if you use the groundwater too quickly, you will run out of water because you don't have that much precipitation. You also have reservoirs near Las Vegas that are drying up because you don't have the amount of precipitation to replenish the amount of water that's being taken out of the reservoirs to use. Also, the overuse of trees from a forest would be another example of using renewable resources faster than they can be replenished. It takes a long time for trees to grow to a mature size. So if you cut down a lot of trees from a forest to use the wood from the trees, you're not going to have any wood for a long time because you're gonna to have to wait for those trees, for new trees that you might grow 
you have to wait for them to grow to maturity to cut them down. Also overloading areas with waste and pollution degrades natural capital as well. And solutions, solutions are ways of mitigating problems related to degrading our natural capital. So we can have scientific solutions. For example, stop cutting down mature trees and allowing trees in forests to grow back. We can recycle and use biodegradable products. We can use hybrid cars. We can have political solutions, which include laws and regulations. For example, during a drought period, we can have water restrictions. And some towns will say you can only water your lawns at certain times and certain days. They tell restaurants not to give people glasses of water unless they ask, things like that. Conflicts arise among people when we have different priorities or different agendas. And in that case, we need to make compromises. Compromises limit how sustainable we could be though. For example, moving away from using fossil fuels to curb climate change versus the interests of the coal and oil industries. So in order to work between limiting fossil fuel use and the interests of the oil and coal industries, we would have to come to some sort of compromise there. Some examples of solutions for degradation of non-renewable resources include reuse and recycling. Reusing includes using a resource over and over again without changing its form. So like using a glass juice bottle as a vase instead of disposing of it. And recycling is when you actually process waste into new materials. That would include melting down aluminum cans in order to make aluminum foil. And there's a website, I want to be recycled.org. And you can take a look at that. And there's a recycling game there as well. And you can learn some more about recycling. So humans are living unsustainably. I bet you could have guessed that. That is not a surprise. Humans are causing degradation of natural capital. And this diagram from the textbook shows you examples of degradation of what is normally renewable natural resources. So air pollution, shrinking forests, soil erosion, aquifer depletion, that is depletion of groundwater. Countries differ in how much resources they use and in their environmental impact. So more developed countries, and we're talking about economically developed, including United States, Canada, and Western Europe, make up about 17% of the world's population and use about 70% of the Earth's natural resources. And your, some of your less developed countries make up 83% of the world's population and use only about 30% of the world's resources. So the more developed countries use a lot more resources than the less developed countries. The middle income, moderately developed countries include China, India, Brazil, Thailand, and Mexico. And your low income, least developed countries include Nigeria, Bangladesh, Congo, and Haiti.
pollution is a major cause of environmental degradation. Pollution is the contamination of the environment by a chemical or other agent, for example, noise, heat, and light, to a level that is harmful to humans and other organisms. The example of light being pollution is when you have excess light, like in an suburban or urban area where you have lights on all night long, very, very bright, it affects nocturnal animals. So we actually do have light pollution as well. We are usually more familiar with chemical pollution. Pollution sources can be naturally occurring or caused by human activities. Human activities or human caused, we call anthropogenic. So some naturally occurring pollution sources would be radon gas or arsenic that leaches out of natural bedrock. Anthropogenic, an example would be car, car exhaust. And there were two types of sources, point sources and non-point sources. A point source is a single identifiable source of pollution. For example, you can point to a specific smokestack from a factory. You can point to it and say, that is the source of the pollution. A non-point source is a dispersed source Often it's difficult to identify. In that case, it's a widespread source. So like pesticide runoff from lawns in an entire community, you can't pinpoint and say that particular house. If it's a lot of houses that have pesticides, it would be, okay, this whole neighborhood is all of the lawns in this neighborhood is the non-point source of pollution or road salt that's put down in the winter. The whole area where they put the salt down would be the non-point source. We can mitigate the pollution issue through methods of pollution cleanup and pollution prevention. So we can prevent the pollution in the first place. And if we do, have pollution, then we could try to clean it up. So those are the ways that we could work with pollution issues. Now we're gonna talk about ecological footprints and that goes into our environmental impact. Ecological footprints that is the amount of land and water needed to supply a person or country with renewable resources and to recycle the waste and pollution produced by this resource use. And the per capita ecological footprint is the average ecological footprint of an individual in a given country or area. So one of the activities that you are going to work on, or perhaps you have already done it, is this quiz to find out your ecological footprint, where it comes up with the result of how many Earths you would need to sustain the whole population if everybody lived with the same lifestyle as you do. So you can take the quiz. So it just asks you different questions and then you click add details to improve accuracy. So you just put in, you kind of just move these. And then when you click save, move on to the next question. And then ultimately, it'll tell you how many Earths you need if everyone 
lived like you did. Here is a graph that shows per capita ecological footprints for different countries. And you can see the United States, Canada, United Arab Emirates, Australia, these have the higher ecological footprints per person. Ecological deficits are if the total ecological footprint of a country is greater than its ability to replenish renewable resources and absorb the waste and pollution, basically meaning that the citizens of that country are living unsustainably and are depleting their resources. Humans overall are living unsustainably. The earth really can only sustain a population of 1.3 billion at the current rate of renewable resource consumption. But the current population is approximately 8 billion people. How can we lower our ecological deficit? We can slow population growth, reduce resource waste, reduce poverty, and use renewable energy sources instead of non-renewable energy sources. Let's take a look at the environmental impact model. The environmental impact model shows population, affluence, and technology. In less developed countries, people tend to have more children as compared to more developed countries. Consumption per person or affluence is higher in more developed countries than in less developed countries. We have more technological impact per unit of consumption in more developed countries than we do in less developed countries. And you can see you have your environmental impacts. Now you see the environmental impact is approximately the same for less developed countries as compared to more developed countries. And that's because some of these arrows are larger and some are smaller. So we have more consumption in more developed countries, but you have higher population growth in less developed countries, for example. So we have a high environmental impact in less developed and more developed countries. So let's go through the environmental impact model and discuss the different components. So again, population in less developed countries, you have higher population growth. In more developed countries, you have slower population growth. Affluence or wealth or consumption per person results in a degradation of resources. I'd like you to think for a minute about different resources that you consume today or that you will consume today. For example, you might use toothpaste, shampoo, consume water. So take a minute to think about that. Technical, technological influence. Environmentally harmful influence of technology would be gas guzzling motor vehicles, factories that emit pollution, coal burning power plants, which use up a non-renewable resource and release pollution such as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which alters climate. Technology could also be environmentally beneficial where we have the development of wind turbines, solar power, and fuel efficient cars.
why do we have environmental problems? There were four basic causes, population growth, wasteful and unsustainable resource use, poverty, and the failure to include in market price the harmful environmental costs of goods and services. Population growth. Human population grows exponentially. Each year, approximately 83 million people are added to the world population. The population now is approximately 8 billion. By the year 2050, it may be 9.6 billion. We can potentially slow population growth by encouraging family planning. Wasteful and unsustainable resource use. What do we waste? Growing affluence or wealth results in high levels of consumption and unnecessary waste of resources like food, water, paper, energy. For example, leaving lights on when you're not in the room, leaving the fridge open longer than necessary, taking very long hot showers, leaving the air conditioner on very cold or leaving the heat on very warm, not finishing food at a restaurant and not taking it home for leftovers. These are all ways that we're wasting resources. And mass advertising encourages the idea that buying things and having more material goods will lead to happiness and a better life. There are harmful effects of affluence and there are benefits to affluence. Some of the harmful effects include addiction to materialism, and we could call that affluenza. People can buy anything from anywhere in the world without worrying about the environmental impacts of producing, transporting, and packaging the product that they purchase. This convenience allows for overbuying and thus wasteful and unsustainable resource use. However, the convenience of this can also go under the benefits category because it is beneficial to be able to buy anything from anywhere. Benefits of affluence include having better educational opportunities, better technology. And for example, the United States has excellent sanitary conditions in most places. We have sewers, clean water supplies, abundant food, reduced incidences of life-threatening diseases and longer lifespans. Now we're talking about poverty. When people are unable to fulfill basic needs for adequate water, food, shelter, healthcare, and education, they may inadvertently cause environmental degradation because they are focused on their short-term survival. According to a 2008 World Health Organization study, about 1.4 billion people live in extreme poverty. Extreme poverty generally refers to earning below $1.25 per day. In the United States, poverty is when you have a family of four with an income less than $24,250. That's according to 2015 guidelines. Many people who are poor rely on their children for survival. So that leads to people living in poverty, having more children and thus more population growth. Children help gather fuel like firewood, drinking water, and they help work with crops and livestock. And children also help take care of parents in their old age. Keep in mind that ages in the 40s and 50s may be considered old age in poor nations that are less developed. As a result of people relying on children for survival, population grows rapidly in poor nations. 
Some other reasons for past for fast population growth in poor nations include the lack of birth control and family planning resources and education, and not all babies or children will survive, so that is a reason to have more. A major way of mitigating overpopulation is to elevate the status of women. With education, meaning allowing women to attend school, women can end up getting employed and naturally the number of children that women have tends to increase when women are educated and have employment outside of the home. There is an issue regarding the cost of items that we purchase. Not all the true costs for example, the harmful environmental costs are included in prices that we pay for goods and services. For example, scientists and economists estimate the real cost of using gasoline to be about $14 a gallon if you include the environmental and health costs over time. For example, spills that can harm groundwater or surface water or soil in areas surrounding gas stations can get contaminated from spills as well. Air pollution related to vehicles that run on gas and global warming related to the burning of fossil fuels such as gasoline. That comes from the release of carbon dioxide, for example. So all of these examples cost money to fix or deal with and we are not necessarily adding that cost into the cost of buying gasoline. Do you think people would drive the same amount as they do now if they had to pay $14 a gallon for gas? I'd like you to think about that because the question of adding hidden costs for health and environmental issues related to products, if we added those costs in, would we pay those higher costs for items? Would we continue to buy as much? Would we continue to buy as often? So I'd like you to think about that. And in conclusion, what is an environmentally sustainable society? Societies that rely on renewable resources and protect Earth's natural capital. That is all for chapter one. Thank you for listening.